Mm -hmm. All right, we will call this uh, regular session of the Harris County Board of Commissioners August 17th meeting to order. Um, if Commissioner Andrews will give our invitation. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you, Lord, for this beautiful county in which we live. Lord, we come to you tonight with heavy hearts because of things that are going on throughout the world. Lord, we pray for people in Haiti, Lord. We pray for the Afghanistans, Lord, all that's going on there. We pray, God, that you would protect and heal this world. Lord. We pray for people who are suffering from COVID. We thank you, Lord, for your many blessings in spite of all of that. We pray that you would give us wisdom to make good decisions in Jesus' name. Everyone will stand for the pledge of allegiance to the flag of our country. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The first thing on our agenda is the minutes from the regular session of August 3rd, 2021, planning session of July 26, 2021, and the call sessions of 11 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. of August 10th, 2021. We have a motion uh, to approve the minutes. I'll make the motion to approve. A motion, do we have a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? All opposed? Minutes are approved. Do we have uh, any other appearances of citizens other than Mr. Kaminsky? Mr. Kaminsky, if you would like to come up and speak at this time, you have uh, five minutes to, to make your comment. And Mr. Dowling will be uh, clocking you. Are we ready with the clock? Thank you very much for yes. uh, having me on the agenda this evening. My purpose tonight today is to bring you up to date with pickleball. And some of you may not know what pickleball is. I'm going to bring you, I, I sent all of you by way of email a copy of, of um, the pickleball agenda or pickleball fact and media sheet for 2021. And I hope you had a chance to take a look at that. But I'm not going to take, you know, take a chance to go through all of that. Once. Let me say this, if, we, if the county does not activate a pickleball program, we will be way behind other counties in the immediate area. And I'd like to take it through that. Uh, my name is John Kaminsky. I've uh, been resident uh, taxpayer here for around 30 years. Uh, I played tennis at Callaway for, since 1967, and I've come down here from Atlanta. And uh, so I played tennis all my life until three years ago. I picked up a, a pickleball paddle and haven't picked up a tennis racket since then. The difference between tennis, which I loved all my life, and pickleball is that pickleball is fun, which is a fun game. About, we have about five million people uh, playing pickleball on North Carolina on a regular basis in the United States. And I project that uh, that's going to grow astronomically in the next next ten years. Um, I've, I've got experience. I'm, I'm, a civil, I'm a civil engineer, registered professional engineer in the state of Georgia. I have a good friend of ours who's also a pickle player, pickleball player, um, Jeff Rednick, and he's a registered architect. And I want to sort of blend those two things into what I'd like to ask the uh, commissioners to consider. I really don't want you to consider it, I want you to act on it. We need to pick up all outside facilities. And as I understand it, the school board is coming uh, with a proposal to a bonding company to, uh, with a two-pronged thing. We'd like to piggyback on that to install four aquatic, four pick up all courts. My estimate, and I don't, I don't, that used to be a part of my position, is around $70,000. That does not include any of the grading, it does not include lighting, it does not include a covering uh, for, the, for the facilities. 
discussed before, of course. It does include the asphalt, it does include the finished surface, it includes uh, five foot fencing, uh, benches, and a, an awning over the benches, uh, and, 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 and the lining of the courts. <clears throat> I'd like to invite you the, uh, the coordination with the Parks of Recreation, we are putting a clinic on on the 28th. I'd like to invite all of you to attend it from 10 to 12. Uh, it's a Saturday, and you're, you're certainly all invited to come and participate, or at least to watch and watch it. Um, pickleball is played with a paddle, it's played with a, a wiffle ball type thing, it's played with a net. It's somewhere in between tennis and ping pong. It's right in between that. It's played on a court 20 feet by 44 feet, so you know, with a nip. So we'll go quickly through what, what the fact sheet is, and then we'll come back and, and summarize it. So we can do that. Uh, the history, it's a, the history of pickleball is a long standing. It started out in the state of, state of uh, Florida, uh, state of uh, Washington. Uh, talk about the court, the equipment, uh, tournaments. Spalding County is putting on a tournament in September, which is $60,000 prize money for, for the for, uh, professionals. We also include amateurs I have. Uh, Auburn put on a, tur a tournament two months ago with around $50,000 prize money. They had 2,000 participants at uh, that uh, uh, presentation. So it's a, an operation which we, we can draw people into the area and I think it would be good for the county, it would be good for, for the sport. There are there's two ways in which we can raise some uh, money for the sport. One is that the Pickleball Association, National Pickleball Association, will contribute $250 for each member, Pickleball member, to provide uh, equipment, paddles and balls. It will also give $350 to the, uh, can I ask for two more minutes? Well, I don't believe we can give you two more minutes, but you only have five, and that's kind of what the rules are for the, for the, uh, well, since I'm the only, as I understand, the only person here, two minutes shouldn't be too much to ask. I'd like to summarize it. That'd be perfectly fine. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So in summary, in the two minutes that I have here, we, I gave you the sheets here that we showed the Obelika Auburn facility, which is a completely covered facility. Uh, it shows the Spalding County operation also, which I, which I sent to you, which they're, they're going to have a major tournament. And also the last two sheets, I think you've got two sheets, it shows a rendition on the actual property of the county uh, at, at the rec center, showing the uh, eight tennis courts and the quad well, shows actually eight, eight uh, pickleball courts, but we're only asking for four for what we estimate to be a course of $70,000. And I think this money could be readily available, you know, either through, through splash money or through uh, monies uh, from, from the counties. I appreciate your attention and I would like you to consider uh, piggybacking my proposal to this, to this school. Thank you, sir. All right, moving on down our agenda. Uh, I see we have no old business. That's correct, Nancy. Mm -hmm. All right, on to new business. We have the uh, taxpayers, the military fellow here. This is the last of the three public hearings the county is required to hold regarding the notice of intent to increase property taxes. Harris County Board of Commissioners has tentatively adopted a 2021 millage rate, which will require an increase in property taxes by 1.68% in the county wide less West Point area and by 0.52% in the West Point area. This tentative increase will result in a millage 
of 9.38 mills, an increase of 0 0.155 mills in the countywide West, West Point area. Without this tentative tax increase, the millage rate will be no more than 9.225 mills. The proposed tax increase for a home with a fair market value of 225000 is approximately $13.95, and the proposed tax increase for a non-homestead property with a fair market value of 150000 is approximately $9.30. In the West Point area, this tentative increase will result in a millage rate of 5.628 mills and an increase of 0 0.29 mills. Without the tentative tax increase, the millage rate will be no more than 5.599 mills. The proposed tax increase for a home with a fair market value of $175,000 is approximately $2.03, and the proposed tax increase for a non-homestead property with a fair market value of $100,000 is approximately $1.16. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in favor? Or anyone that wants to speak against? Not hearing none, I will close this public hearing. The next item is to set the millage rate. The county was required to hold three public hearings regarding the notice of intent to increase property taxes. The public hearings were held on August 10th at 11 a.m., 6.30 p.m., and during tonight's meeting. Uh, Randy Dallin, county manager, Wayne Morris, chief tax appraiser, and Pete James, tax commissioner, will be present to respond to questions. Do I have a motion to set the county's millage rate? make a motion that we set the county's millage rate at 9.38 mills and the school millage rate at 18.26 mills that we would collect the school board's millage rate. Portion, oh excuse me, one, point, one more point. <laughs> the portion of West Point within the county at 5.628. So we'll collect the school boards and we'll set ours at those rates. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Those that we have a motion and a second, all those in favor? All opposed? All right, our millage rate has been set. And correct me if I'm not wrong, uh, Randy, but that's the same millage rate we have for the last, what, two, three years? Most recent one, we have we've had 9.38 since 2019. Thank you, sir. So it's three years in a row. All right, moving on down to the uh, under new business, we have the uh, first reading of the alcohol of application of Kim Thorpe Chamber of Commerce. Chamber of Commerce is having a special event at FDR Roosevelt State Park during which alcohol will be provided, distributed, and given away. And the alcohol ordinance requires temporary special event license for such an event. Um, Kim Tharp, as the president of the chamber, has applied for a temporary special event. The event will be held September 11th, 2021 at Lake Franklin Event Center. It does meet the qualifications and it's recommended by the Sheriff's Office, Sheriff's Office which is approval. Uh, the Health Department, Community Development Department, is, uh, do not have to have this recommendation. Ms. Thorpe, would you like to make any comments? No. Uh, well, yes, sir, I would. Thank you for, uh, <laughs> thank you for allowing me to do so. Uh, we are really excited. This is the first um, event that we are hosting uh, through our Explorer Harris County GA tourism efforts, and uh, we are promoting it regionally to invite people from not, not only within the county but from outside the county to come join us at one of the greatest hidden gems that FDR has. Very few people that don't live in Harris County have not been up to the Lake Franklin Event Center. We are, uh, we have um, secured, uh, Jamie Keating is our celebrity chef and he is building his menu from, uh, mainly from the farmers in Harris County. Uh, Dr. Andrews is going to provide some vegetables for that uh, as well. We'll also have uh, representation from uh, farmer farms in Harris County as well. So we're really excited about this event. Thank y'all for the opportunity to allow us to have it. Is there anyone here that would like to speak in favor of this? Is there anyone here that would like to speak in opposition? All right.
Store. The second reading of this application is scheduled to be heard September 7th, at which the board will take action. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be dancing some flowers in case y'all like them. Thank you. <coughs> um, our next item is an appointment to the Regulation Board. A vacancy which expires 12 31 2023 exists on the Regulation Board for the representative of the Pine Mountain Youth Sports Association. The Pine Mountain Youth Sports Association has recommended that Sandra Moss, currently an at large member, be appointed to represent the Pine Mountain Youth Sports Association to complete the term formerly held by Brandon Fletcher. Ms. Moss has resigned her position as an at large member in order to be appointed as a representative for the Pine Mountain Youth Sports Association. With the appointment of Ms. Moss as the Pine Mountain Youth Sports Representative, the at large position will be vacant for which any commissioner may make a recommendation, recommendation to fill the vacancy <coughs> tonight or at a further date, the term of which will expire 12-31-23. Uh, I will say this, um, Mr. Fletcher had to resign because he got, uh, became a pastor of a different church outside of the county, and so he's not able to get back to the meetings. That is the only reason he resigned. He was doing a fine job up to that part. Um, Miss Moss, who had been our at-large representative on the rec board for a while, Pine Mountain Youth Sports has a, a rule that two members can't be on the Pine Mountain Youth Sports Association board at the same time as their husband and wife. Her husband agreed through them to step down off the Pine Mountain Youth Sports Association board so that she could move from at-large to the Pine Mountain Youth Sports Association representative on the rec board because we know in commissioners that have been here, we've had to kind of almost like a revolving door for that. And so that is why this is taking place. Um, so just you now just giving you a little background of why we're having, we were having to do this and we feel like since uh, Miss Moss and Sandra have been on the board as a large for a while, that'll be the perfect fit for the Pine Mountain representative. And we would need a motion and a vote needed to appoint Miss Moss at the Pine Mountain Youth Sports Association rep and I'll make the motions to appoint Ms. Moss as uh, Pine Mountain Youth Sports Association representative. Uh, I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? All opposed? All right, Ms. Moss will be appointed. Um, is there anyone that has someone in mind to take the at-large position? I do. Um, I have someone who's contacted me, a um, Simon Wiggs, on Brown Harris County, young lady. She is a teacher at Creekside. She has four children, ages uh, 10 to 18. All four have participated over the last 14 years in soccer. Um, the youngest now does not participate in soccer. She chose another sport. But um, Ms. Williamson has been associated with the Soccer Association for 14 years as the vice president. She's currently their game scheduler. She's been their rules expert. Um, so she has expressed um, an interest in serving on the rec board for that at-large seat. I did talk to a couple of other people who know her, and they did give her glowing recommendations since she's a very hard worker. So I would like to uh, recommend Simon Williamson to fill that the at-large state of Wisconsin. And I'll say that motion. Uh, I know her and she has uh, been hard, a, a real hard worker with soccer, but I'll also say this. Uh, we almost had her appointed a couple of years ago, but she was not on the Pine Mountain Youth Sports Association board at the time, and we did not have an at-large position open at that time. So I know she has been uh, thought of being on the board uh, previously. There being a motion and a second, is there any more discussion? All those in favor? All those opposed? Thank you. And uh, Nancy, you'll let the chairman know him now. Thank I'll you. Thank you, ma'am. All right, moving on down to the county manager, Mr. County Manager. Mr. Vice Chairman, Board of Commissioners, item number seven. Speed table program or consideration of this new program. Uh, county staff was requested several months ago to prepare a speed table program as a traffic calming measure for the board's consideration. 
County staff have reviewed the Georgia Department of Transportation speed table guidelines, along with about five other Georgia governmental speed table programs in order to prepare the county speed table program. This proposed program was reviewed by the board during July 26th retreat. At that retreat, the board wanted to know more about the cost of the speed tables. According to the research we conducted, a rubber speed table made with recycled material 21 feet long, 22 and a half feet wide, and three inches high, which is basically the GDOT's specifications, would cost about $10,000 to purchase and install. An asphalt or concrete speed table would cost about seven to $8,000, roughly. Since a series of speed tables may be used to solve a traffic calming issue, multiple speed tables may be needed in a particular subdivision or application. So, a motion of what is needed tonight to initiate the speed table program was prepared. You can see in your agenda package, you have a sample two-page program that was again crafted for many other Georgia governmental speed table programs. Um, you can see GDOT's uh, guidelines for speed tables along with a proposed design specification for the speed table as well as a cost estimate from a manufacturer of rubber speed tables. So we have to, to answer any questions more we have um, before the project is initiated. In other counties that have a similar speed table program, do the property owners pay the full amount in each of those programs? Most of the programs the county did make the uh, people who wanted them pay through various different mechanisms. I just think the county ought to have some skin in the game. Um, I would, I think I would prefer that the county pay half and the residents pay half. That, that might be a more fair way to implement the program. Of course, we can't predict how many. So we might say in the first year, let's just say we put $25,000 and we would pay half up to that amount, and then we, that might give us a feel for what we're looking for. I don't know how the others feel about it, but I just think we ought to pay a little bit of it. Since it's going to be on the county road. Again, I looked at five or six of them. They all did about the same. Some had little peculiarities here and there, but primarily most of them, the citizens paid for the actual cost of installation or the um, removal of the speed tables once they didn't like them anymore. Um, well, I, I can agree with the citizens removing it because they only got there because they asked for it. Right. So now if you want it removed, you pay to have it removed. But I think. Um, because it is a safety issue and in a lot of our subdivisions that we might not have to skin it. Yeah. Some counties even put it on the annual tax bill, like the solar waste bill we have. Um, some counties, you know, receive the money up front and then did the project. So it, it's a it's a different every every county has a different mechanism, but I got the common threads that made sense and put it in this meet table program. Um, but they the all the, the common thread among all of them was it was a petition-based program. The citizens petitioned themselves to have this speed calming device in their neighborhood. And then they paid for a portion of this program. And that's 80%. We did, again, every county was different. 80, 90%, 75%, but 80 was like a, a, a common number. But in ours, we had, they were paid 100%. No, 80% of the people no, were wanting them. Oh, yes, 80% oh, yes. of the residents. Yes, that's right. So with that being said, as far as the removal of these, you would think, and they're just going off the materials and the way this is constructed, you would think that the asphalt speed tables, even though they're a lower cost, would be a little bit more of a hindrance and a little bit more of a, kind of a pain to remove, especially yes. at the time to do so. So we're really looking at the recycling program. I think that would be more versatile to <laughs> order a product, get it delivered, bolt it on, it's relatively quick and easy, and if it wants to be removed in the future, it can easily be removed. Right. You know, by public works crews. Well, there are three speed tables at the high school right now. They just put them in, I'm going to say roughly about two weeks ago. Asphalt. They're concrete. <clears throat> they're not asphalt, they're 
concrete, and they're right at where the speed bumps used to be, going out the back of the high school where the new middle school is going to be. And the speed bump deterred the kids speeding out the back. The speed tables, I don't think it really deterred it, although it has helped not tear up the undercarriage of cars. But now they're hitting the speed tables, and you know, they can almost they come off a little bit. Um, you know, and I'm just saying, we actually do now have three speed tables that are in the county that we've never had before. Um, my suggestion would be before we really go whole hog, I think we ought to kind of take a, maybe take a minute and see how those speed tables work before we jump into a program. So then we'll know if we need to put money in, if we don't need to put money in, if we need to have the, the people, you know, basically do a little bit more research on it. I mean, I, you know, because I, I, I believe we all want to be safe. But if these are going on subdivision roads, not actual county roads, you know, the school is probably the best place to have some research because of the fact the kids really aren't flying up down roads at 60 miles an hour. I don't know. And to go back to the asphalt or the, uh, the, the rubber. Because they just have been put in within the last two weeks. Speed tables on the drive. If you know anything about Muskogee County, where the central office is, there's internal roads there around the government center and the library. We had speed tables there, and it really did um, deter the speeding through there. And of course, you have to have signs that indicate you have a speed table coming up. But I'm not. I don't know what the dimensions. Are of the ones that I'm familiar with. It, three inches doesn't seem like much of a height. I think. What was the DOT? Three or four inches. Three or four inches of So, what kind of data would we collect from the high school? I don't know. Uh, and that was going to be my next thing. Is I'm not real sure, but. Other than I'm wanting, you know, I, I've seen the kids go out there and they're not tearing up the indicator to the car anymore. Uh, I'm not sure it's deterred the speed, but I'm not saying the kids should speed out the back anyway. Um, I know the buses are going over it, and the way they've done them at the high school, which we may not have to do anywhere else, is one of them is a higher bump here, but it's flatter when you come off because of the way the road is at the high school. So. Going over it this way, it's a smooth transition. Coming the other way, you can you can actually feel your car give you a little bump when you come off come off of it. I don't know because you know I've I've always been used to the speed bumps, haven't done speed tables, uh, and I'm like I said, I'm not opposed to doing speed tables. I don't know if the county should put in 50 percent. Uh, that part I'd have to kind of look at. Well, looking into this too, it said here and said that the recommendation for curriculum design requirements was really not just one speed table, it was actually show a succession of two. Right. So the speed table you know, should be placed from anywhere from 200 to 500 feet apart to be able to you know, adhere to the 25, 30 mile an hour you know, speed table. So, you know, it, you know, that's something else to consider too. Are we looking at just placing one and then putting a, a secondary? You know, they have three, they put three at the high school. Yeah, because I, I know I've been I've been approached by several people, you know, and by this wanting, you know, a uh, speed table program. So I know this is how visibility lists as well. What do we do about the roads that are in subdivisions that aren't county roads? If we're going to put in some money on the road, if we're going to put in some money on the road in the subdivision that the county owns the road. But those people come to us on the speed table, are we just going to tell them they have to fund the whole thing? No, they do have to fund 100%. I mean, I'm saying that... We're you know, not even going to put it in. No, no, that's what I'm saying. But, you know, that's some things we have to think about if we're going to do this. I don't think anybody's opposed to the program. I just think we need to make sure we have everything in a row of how we're going to do it. I can't agree with you. I'd like to see how those work out. And I can't even remember the little town we were in, and I told you about it, the blood of it to them day. And they had the actual speed tables, which look like this, yeah. which I've never seen before. On, the, on one of the back streets, they okay. had about three in a row. Lux has some too, on some of their downtown back streets. It was up close to Newman. I can't remember what it was. But it was a small town. 
a decade of those back then. First time I had seen the action speed tape rather than the speed bump. Yeah, the speed bumps were terrible. Yeah, yeah. speed tape. These were these are nice. Yeah. But but I don't I mean I don't think it would hurt. I mean to wait. And maybe see how those work out yeah. there, but I don't want to maybe maybe look a little more and see if we really want to do the fifty percent. Um, well, if we instituted a program of speed tables, the, the, the people still have to come to us and request it and get a petition and do all that. Um, you know, we still, I, I don't know about the pre percent because you're actually doing it for a small few people in the subdivision. Some changes. Just prove it like it is. With them paying 100%, we'll see what we get. Oh, yeah, and then, and then that's, yeah, you're right. And then if we actually receive any of the right. right. Yeah. I know there are two subdivisions in my district that are just waiting on this, right. but if they find out they got to pay 100% now, they and may they continue to work. I don't know. Well, then they may not want but, the asphalt. I mean, they may not want the rubber, they may want the asphalt because it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, we're not installing it. That's that's on them. But should we give them a choice? Yeah, they should. That, that's, I agree. They should. Or we might want to find out about the concrete because I mean I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure the ones at the high school are concrete. They're not asphalt. And it's not the black uh, asphalt that you normally see, and it's not. I know it's not rubber. Did a paving company put them in? I'm assuming whoever paved the road, because they did the new entrance or did yeah. a uh, paved entrance out the back to boot new. Uh, Three entrances or two turn lanes and the end. I'm assuming that they did. So that's permanent. It's not really a mobile. No, it's it's permanent there on the back. Um, and and I, you know it's it's funny is that um, we have been talking about speed tables, and when they finally uh, school started and we were able to come back in the back, they had to shut off for working on school. The first thing I did is I saw speed tables and I started laughing. I said, Well, dang, we just had a meeting, you know, talking about speed tables. But you, you're right, we can approve it to see what happens, and then if we need to in a year, we can adjust. Yeah, with the provision, we this in a year. Yeah. And then. Well, I just have a question, I'm guessing, but if you give them a choice, it's going to, the conflict's going to be more difficult to do because they're going to have to go back out there and, you know, make sure people aren't messing with the wet concrete. The asphalt would be could be difficult because the prices would go up. The rubberized would be the easiest because if we order it, we put it down. You know that might be the easiest, fastest way to get it in place. And to remove it. And to remove it. Mm -hmm. They're paying to remove it. Mm -hmm. And if they're paying for it 100 percent, really the county's really not out of anything really. Other than just time and labor of putting it in. Right. Right. That's how we you know. We I think that makes more sense. Well, I think, uh, I think we ought to probably um, leave the asphalt speed tables in there just in case you get a subdivision that would rather have asphalt based on the, the aesthetics of their subdivision. But uh, I think that you're not think y'all are right. The rubber was probably more efficient, especially if we ever have to remove it. But if we approve this, we can always come back in a year and, and revisit the percentage of what we put in or whatever we have to do. You know, I think I want to make a motion to approve this with the with the um, caveat there that we, we um, I guess we revisit this in a year's time frame and be able to associate 100% of the cost to the request. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. All right, we have a motion and second. Do we have any other discussion? All right, all those in favor? All opposed? It's in your. It's a. I believe it's in the packet. I don't know where. But I read it somewhere. Is it up front or on the No, 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 no. Up front. We, we, it needs to be read. This needs to be read. I understand it. Um, who pays for the speed tables? Yes. It's paid by the affected property owners that own real property on the affected roads or on the subdivision. To recoup the county's investment, all installation costs will be calculated and paid by the impacted property owners prior to construction. The impacted property owners working through their designated community representative will have 120 days 
after board approval to pay the county for installation or the application will lapse and we must be started again. Once the full amount is received by the county, construction will begin. It's spelled out pretty clearly. All right. Any more discussion on that? All right. If not, let's move on now to uh, next item. Mr. Dallin. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, Board of Commissioners, uh, this is a proposal for consideration for the Georgia Department of Transportation's 5311 Rural Transportation Program. Uh, again, the board asked the staff to gather some information. And this information was, was discussed in detail at the retreat on July 26. To go over some highlights of this public transportation program for rural areas, uh, this program is a, has been a long established program through the Department of Transportation for many, many years. Uh, to provide citizens with curb to curb travel assistance to and from medical appointments, shopping, jobs, school, recreation, and senior citizen centers, and even to destinations in neighboring counties. Uh, most counties in the state have this kind of rural public transit operation. About 36 of Georgia's 159 counties, including Harris County, do not have this type of public transit. So most counties have it, some don't, including Harris. There's no income or age restrictions to use this program. Uh, currently, the 5311 program in this area is operated by the Lord Chattanooga Regional Transit Authority with staff assistance from the River Valley Regional Commission. The Transit Authority consists of three counties currently, Quitman, Stewart, and Randolph. This Regional Authority contracts with a third party provider called RMS to operate all aspects of the program. The third party operator is responsible for hiring all the drivers, training the drivers, accepting calls, and scheduling rides providing insurance, maintaining the vans, reporting accidents, preparing GDOT required reports and other required and needed reports, having operating policies and procedures, conducting accounting and resolving complaints. In general, uh, if a citizen wants to, use, wants to use this program, they simply call the third party operator at least 24 hours in advance to schedule a trip. Uh, the capacity is checked to make sure the trip can be accommodated. Those of 16 years or old must be accompanied by an adult. There's a very nominal fee for this service, usually in the one to three dollar range. Uh, this is, a, this is a, an on-demand service. There are no fixed routes, bus stops, or pickup times. Uh, this program, if approved and funded, will be heavily advertised by the county and the third party operator. Again, this, these vans are typically airport shuttle top vans with passenger capacities of 11 to 14 people per van and those wheelchair lifts when needed. Uh, the, this, this program will operate Monday through Friday 8 to 5 except holidays. If approved, the original authority would have to include Harris County along with Quitman, Stewart, and Randolph uh, to be part of that regional authority and that can easily be done through local legislation in January. The cost of the county would be minimal to pay for a small operate, operate, the small portion of operating cost and subsidized capital costs for the vans. Estimated cost per year would be well under $50,000 and can be funded by TSPLOS funds. A GR application needs to be completed by December of this year and the Regional Transit Authority along with the third party operator will complete the application on behalf of the county um, before the deadline. The next step, if the board wants to pursue this program, would be for the board to approve their attached resolution and all and any of the necessary documents to authorize the transit authority to file an application on the board's behalf and submit it to the GDOT by the deadline. If approved, this program can be budgeted for and begin early 2023, subject to availability of the needed vans. So a motion and a vote is needed to approve the attached resolution. So the, transit, so the regional transit authority can begin their application process and have it submitted to GDOT by their deadline date. Randy, I'm just curious. The third party is normally based not in the county, but 
Would it be in Columbus, McBride? RMS is based in a city, in a very small city. I forgot what the name of it is. It's in one of those three counties. Oh. So that's where it's based, and that's where they take telephone calls from. Okay. And they dispatch people you know, via radio.
I would like to see that 42 or whatever the number turns out to be go toward another project on our ARP list. Maybe the courthouse, uh, maybe the internet, I don't know. But since we're going to have to approve an additional $37,916 and we have discussed very loosely another $42,000 to the Mercer Med Clinic, I personally would like to see that $42,000 go to another project on our ARP list. And maybe it's usually we can do that. Uh, help me understand what is your thought process on moving this from SPAS to ARP and why you're making this recommendation? <coughs> uh, ARP money is available. ARP money is exactly what Mercer Med, that the community clinic, that's what that funding is for, to help the community with medical needs. Um, that's a perfect use of ARP funds. Uh, then that will re then we, then the board can reallocate SPAS 19 funds for other SPLOS 19 projects. Now that, at one time, correct me if I'm wrong, at one time we talked about that any of that renovation for that library, if we did not use it, because at the time we did not know what we were going to use the building for, or renovate it for, that it could go toward the courthouse repairs, right? I think that, I'm pretty sure that's what So any dollars that is SPLOS 19, can be used for any of those voter approved projects. Okay. So any money okay. that we... So that would be, yes. So, so that's lost that team money for the 48 for the roof and 143,000 for the SBC. If, it, if it's reallocated from plus 19 to ARP, then that's the money that can go toward the courthouse. Right. Yes, or any other right. uh, voter approved projects is plus 19. Right. Yes. Right. So that was my thought process there. But the first thing we have to do is vote on the change order before we can get into all that other stuff. Yes. Correct? And my recommendation is to approve the change order 37916 coming from ARP funds. So where would this money come from if we decided not to use ARP funds? Where would that come from? It wouldn't come from SPLOS, would it? Or would it? I thought SPLOS was already spoken for. On 2019. It could, it could come from general fund. Or I think it could, from, it could come from also SPLOS 2019, because that's where the other amount is I also. I thought that was one of the projects in 2019. It is. It is. It is. So it could come from general funds or SPLOS 2019 or ARP. Okay. I'm recommending ARP. How much money, and you may not know this, do we have left in SPLOS 19 funds? What? Just enough. I mean. Well, if, for example, in SPLOS 19, we, we allocated $350,000 to the old library for its renovation. Right. So we have plenty of money remaining. To do that. Yes. And if we don't use that, then we could allocate that toward the, the courthouse. Mm -hmm. But don't we also have in plus 19 uh, money for broadband? Yes. So we could allocate... Any project. Right. So we could actually take some of the money, whatever was left, have to go to the courthouse, have to go into our broadband. But the difference with broadband, though, from what I'm understanding from the gratuities act, with the art fund in itself, is this not it's not, not applicable to the gratuity clause. And the reason why it has to stay in fund 230. So the reason why it has to stay in fund 230 to be able to go towards broadband, to be able to utilize it. Splash, you couldn't do that. It's still it is still adhere to the gratuity clause. County funds have to abide by the state's gratuity funds. Yes. Federal money, we have learned, does not. And who says it does not? ACCG. Yes. And so we ACCG. Yes. That's a uh, opinion by ACCG. That is that an they opinion have by recently. Yes. Um, no, attorneys. They're attorneys. They're not able to point to a, a particular case on all fours, but they believe that the proposition is defensible. So they, they, they believe it's defendable. Yeah. That's they believe, right. Yeah, are they that's going to defend us in something down the road? <laughs> yeah, well, that's what the ACC did. We go to jail, you <laughs> think ACC is going to take our fuck? Well, let me ask you this. Um, from a legal standpoint, is it just the purpose of your, uh, I guess, whenever you interpret this, it's off, it's off the interpretation? 
of you guys, ACCG included? Right. So when we were first looking at this issue, I reached out to ACCG to get their thoughts on, you know, how this broadband can be done based on that y'all had, and they're of the opinion and of the, of the fact that you can use the federal funds without violating the state gratuity clause, and there are ways to further mitigate it, such as um, owning particular property for a certain amount of time with an accelerated depreciation schedule, um, and then you turn it over to that entity to also further mitigate any challenge under the gratuity clause. But based on my initial review and discussions with ACCG, I am more comfortable with that proposition, which is these federal funds can be used uh, without concerns under the state gratuity clause. And with your depreciation clause that you were actually mentioning, which would actually kind of facilitate the discussion with, say for instance, like we would lease, uh, in this case, lease conduit that would be in the ground, lease it to a provider, and then over that time, over depreciation, then it would eventually go towards the provider in case. That's right. right. Yeah. That's right. And then the idea is you're providing that um, over time for the, you know, the benefit that the county receives um, and, and that provider providing those services. Right. Which would be an augmentation to the services provided to our neighbors or constituents of the county, which would be upgrading their broadband access or broadband technology standpoint, correct? That is correct. Um, but as I've always said from day one, um, I, I think to further mitigate any concerns that the county needs to look at this as a kind of holistic method and not look at it at a granular level where you're looking to just uh, assist one particular neighborhood or another. And so the county needs to look at this at a con on a comprehensive plan level um, and find a way where it can facilitate the most bang for the buck and provide the most uh, broadband outreach as possible with the funds that it has. And one of those ways that we discuss doing that is working with the AMC, the hopes, Palo, and hopes that we can find a way to try to uh, assist in providing broadband, for example, to all EMC customers, which of course would include a, a large portion of the unincorporated county. And that's just one consideration. And I know that uh, that verse is applied for some of these state funds coming down from the federal government with the idea that it would cover a decent portion of the underserved area of the county. So, so Randy, can you tell us exactly where we are on that, working with the first panel? Okay. Um, I sent an email out to everybody a couple of days ago. Um, Washington is giving out all kind of money. Um, a lot of money is going to the state. And the state has opened a grant uh, program up for water, sewer, and broadband. They opened it up, they opened up a grant program August 1st, and the, the grant program ends August 31st. It's a 30 day window to submit for counties and cities and nonprofit organizations to submit grants to the state to improve water, sewer, or broadband. The county is in a position with our consultants to submit an application on the county's behalf for an elevated storage tank in the Mulberry Grove area to serve that area of the, of the 315 corridor. Uh, we're going to request about two minutes. The application be prepared right now for the 31st deadline by our consultants. It's going to be about a $2 million grant. And with maybe a $250,000 match from the county as matching money to have skin in the game. So a $2 million grant, $250,000 matching money from ARP, which is a, a suitable um, project for this money. So that's one application. $2 million gallon elevated storage tank, $2 million roughly with the county putting in $250,000 for match money from ARP and asking for $1.75 from the, from the state grant to build that tank sometime next year if the grant is approved. Divorce Power, on our behalf, is going to also apply for broadband money. 
for the northeast part of the county and the northwest part of the county. They're going to put an application in of about $25 million in, that, in those general areas of the county and other counties, but primarily in Harris County. And they would like to have a letter of support so to prove to the grant reviewers that they have got county input and skin in the game. And for that, I'm recommending a letter of support be given to Diverse Power for their application by December, by August 31st, and, and authorizing a quarter million dollars, at least a quarter million dollars, from ARP funds as matching money to have skin in the game so the reviewers at the state can see that the county is serious about Diverse Power's application and has put in ARP money as matching funds. So those are the two applications that we're going to submit, or we hope to submit, by the August 31st deadline. Most cities and counties are not submitting. They have no technical expertise, they have no time, they have, they have, they just, most towns and cities just don't know what to do. So we cobbled together these two projects because of the state, because of the state grant program. Absent the state grant program, we would be doing this. But there's a lot, there's hundreds of millions of dollars available in this one grant program. It's highly political. The reviewers are state reps, state senators, and state level, high level state level bureaucrats. So it's highly political. So they're going to see all aspects of it. They're going to see coordination between the government and, and, the, and the broadband providers. And since it's federal ARP money, the gratuity clause doesn't have to be uh, adhered to. If if we if we did that, and this is for Russell, and it's for two areas of the county, you said the north, north west. west. Okay, is that Russell mentioned a concern? Uh, Russell, can you hear? <laughs> yeah, I can hear the same way. Okay. Okay, he mentioned a concern that it made for certain areas. So if you could ask him, if you can't hear me, if you could ask him, um, would that be a concern? Okay. Russell, in diverse powers application, their primary goals is where they have infrastructure. And that's in the northwest part of the county and the northeast part of the county in various subdivisions in those two areas. Because they don't have many, they don't have much infrastructure in the southern part of the county. Will that be an issue or a problem? That we're yeah. from like a gratuity standpoint. That we're just, just talking about when it's or is. or from a granular point of view. Yeah. You know, I, I don't when, think so because I, I think I think this latest proposal, as I understand it from you, Randy, um, is a good compromise because it allows diverse to go after money for areas that they already had infrastructure in and right. so they are able to expand broadband at a cheaper rate in that area and it also benefits the county because it covers a lot of underserved areas of the county that of course we're trying to get to that's that's exactly correct right. right, well, let me ask you this question can we use this plus 19 money that we earmark for broadband to buy the conduit that Commissioner Irons was talking about. Because if we're buying a conduit and we own it and then we lease it to them, are we able to use that SPLOS 19 money or do we actually have money in SPLOS 19 that we earmark for broadband that we can never use? I'm going to look at how the language is written and the SPLOS 19 to give you a full answer on that. I don't know if I can answer that on the spot without seeing exactly how it was written. Right. Because as you know, when you when you vote on SPLOS, depending on the language and that SPLOS, you may or may not be limited on how you can spend it. But I guess to take a step back and answer your general question, which is, do I think that is there a way that we can use the SPLOS money for broadband? That answer would be yes. Okay. You know, we, we certainly can find a way to use our SPLOS money for broadband. And then two, as far as uh, having a, I guess a, you know, a request on, uh, request and a requirement for our letters of support to the EMC, would, uh, 
I would like to be able to see what their proposed technology types are and also what their proposed service areas are. Northeast and northwest of Harris, of Harris County is, is vague, so I would really like to know what their, um, their targeted areas are and also how many, what homes there are, how many homes that they're, they're saying that they can actually provide or access, right? Because underserved is really definitive, defined really by the 25 and 3 definition that the state of Georgia came up with broadband ready, right? So where exactly are they trying to service in those two targeted areas? How many people are they trying to target or do they propose to target? And what technology types are they bringing to the board? All right, well, not to cut you off, but considering that we're really only talking about trying to do this change order, yeah. right. that's what we need to, to kind of focus on with this. I mean, all of that discussion is good discussion, and we need to have it. Uh, if, you know, because if we can buy the conduit and lease it, that might be a way to, to do it that way, too. All right, so what we really got to decide is what we want to do on this change order. Yes. We know we're going to spend $191,000. We put the change order of 37916, puts us up to about what, 230,000? 228. Right. Change. So that's what we know that we have already said we were going to do for Mercer, the 191. They need another roughly 40,000 for that. All right. And you're recommending the 37916 come out of ARP money. Yes. That's what you're recommending there. Yes. For, for the change order only. Yes. Not talking about anything else. Yeah. Correct. Because the other money has come out as plus 19. That's correct. That's what I'm saying. So all we're voting on is 37916. From ARP. From ARP. Change order number one. All right. Well, I make the motion that we do the change order of 37916 from the ARP funds because I don't think 37916 is going to hurt us with that, those funds we have on any of the other projects that we're trying to do. And I'll second that. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion on that? The question I have, I thought, Randy, you said that you wanted to take the full funding. That'd be another motion. Okay. That's another motion. We ain't, that we ain't got there yet. So I'm presenting my cause as is. Right. right. So right now, That's all it. we're doing is 37,916 out of ARP money, nothing else. Nothing else. Right. As presented. All in favor of the change order of 37,916. All opposed. All right, that passes. Now, the other thing you were proposing was to take the 191000 from SPLOS 19 that we've already allocated yes. to come out of ARP money. Yes. I think we probably ought to, since we've allocated it, I think we ought to leave it where it is and not try to get into the weeds of, of this and that. We know we have that money there. We know that we agreed to do it there. I say we just leave it. As is. As is. It's lost right. money. Lost money. Yeah, I say we just leave that 191 as is. Now, yeah. considering that's what we, you know, gave to all of our constituents that we we're going to use that money for. That's the, right. It's the it's the approved budget that way. Right. Done. And then any other lost money we have left over, at that time we can look at adding it to we all, what we already have for broadband in spots, or we can add to the courthouse at that time at the later date. Because you said that we have about 350000 for Mercer Man. No. 350 to run the whole library. Right. Uh, well, that's, what I mean. that's what I meant for the whole yeah. library. And we've used yeah. 191 of it, and no more should come from that. That's right. So, what that's right. so whatever that's left, then we can decide if we want to put some of that toward what we already have for Plus 19 Broadband, or toward the courthouse, or both, or whatever. Yes. We can discuss that at a later time. Yes. So roughly 159000 is left. Yeah. All right. That's if you collect. That's, that's, that's right. That's if we say. That's if you collect that amount. Right. right. And right there, we're way over. Right. right. But in the future. Okay. All right. So no, that's, no, no, no. A, that's approved for the change order. Let's that's go on down to county manager and go on to the project updates. My favorite part. Can I make one comment before we move on? I don't know if any of y'all were on the the town hall call last night with our House of Representatives representative from Congress. But you know, next week is the F of D. They're going back next week in the House to vote on the infrastructure bill and the reconciliation bill. 
And one of the things that uh, he made reference to in the call last night was in the infrastructure bill, there is money for broadband. He also made the comment that he thought it would not help us one penny in this district. Yeah, he said, you heard it, yeah. He said, I don't think that we will ever see a man with money if it's paid. So I just thought, I, I just thought that was interesting. Um, I think he has his reasons for thinking that. I won't go into what those are. But uh, I thought that was, I thought that was interesting. Did he say that? Before we work, hitting the hot points. Number four, complete the update of Kansas Land Development Code. We're going to file that application on September 20th. The first reading will be on October 20th at the Planning Commission level. The second reading and adoption will be November 2nd at the board level. And the UDC goes into effect on November the 16th if everything goes well during the public hearings. Number eight, prison roof. The bit, the, we are preparing bid specs to go out next week. <coughs> Number eleven, the annual Elmig resourcing program. I'm hoping to have the list of roads for the board to approve at the next meeting to send a GDOT for that annual resourcing road program. Number eighteen, Ellison Park. We are developing that park every day. We're doing a lot of land clearing. We found the place for the maintenance facility, several pavilions. Uh, we've ordered the gates, the signs. We've, we've gotten, we've received parking blocks. So we were, we're getting ready to, to develop it. And, and there's, there's been a lot of land clearing. It's starting to look like a park now. So that is ongoing. And the new Eversley Park caretaker has been hired. He begins Monday. So we will have a full-time person with an inmate crew there, full-time, getting the park developed with the assistance of Public Works, the county prison, and a lot of other folks. Is it a local person? Is it a local person? Number 22, phase four of the Battle of War Trail. That is uh, ongoing, and that should be completed by early December of this year. All the vehicles and the budget has been approved, that have been approved has been ordered. They will be here until the middle of next year. Number 44, the roof and the HVAC system of the old library. That is continuing. The board has approved a change order for that. Using SPLOS 19 funds and some ARP funds. Number 45, the impact fee study. That is progressing, and we should have a meeting with the committee very soon, hopefully next month, to keep, to keep that project moving. Who's going to have the meeting? Who's having the meeting? The impact fee committee. Yeah, Oh, yeah, but you said we will be having a meeting. The impact fee committee. Oh, okay, just the committee. The impact fee okay. committee. I got you. We'll have a meeting probably September to keep that project moving. I got you. So you can see in the loss charts what we collected for the year. Now the whole year is whole fiscal year is done. It's lost and lost. We're at 181 percent. So last year when we when we prepared the budget under COVID. Under COVID, we thought we would get a lot less tax revenue. The opposite occurred. Um, so you can see last year, the county received in SPLOS 2.9 million. <coughs> this year, we got 3.6 in the era of COVID. Hope it keeps going. Hope it keeps going. So the difference was that really was through the new bill passed by the governor, the bill to give us, uh, I guess, the bill tax from e commerce. Um, not really, no. no. I attribute this to instead of people going to the brick and mortar stores of Walmart mm -hmm. and Publix and Kroger and Target in a neighboring county, they ordered on the telephone 
it to be delivered to their home and businesses That's in the county. That's what and that made all the difference in the world. That's what I'm saying. And people step home and order stuff. If you order stuff, the sales tax comes to the county in which it's ordered, not where it was purchased. The reason for e exactly. That is an e-commerce thing. I hope that model stays active. People don't go to brick and mortar stores, they still buy on Amazon and other e-commerce sites. So, so well, it's like all the Dollar General did to hers. People want the Dollar General. Especially the ones that have the produce and all in the Dollar yeah. General. So, we received a lot more lost money, a lot more lost money, 156%. Again, half a million dollars more than the previous fiscal year. Taste laws, same situation. Single family owned building permits in July was 24. So we're keeping track of single family owned building permits. So it's keeping track of the previous years. And my, the most interesting chart is the salt waste tonnage disposal. In July it was over 1,700 tons. It, has, it was 1,700 tons one time last fiscal year and none in the previous fiscal year. So we are seeing a, 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 a dramatic tick up in solid waste tonnage in the county <coughs> that we're processing. Be happy to answer any questions where we have on the program. Just refresh my memory on the loss. Is it this year or next year that we negotiate renewal for the loss? Every 10 years. It'll be It'll be next year. It'll be, I think it has to be done. I was thinking it's coming up. It, it's so about it's a year away. Okay. So the loss negotiations are done every 10 years, and it's about one year away. Okay, and the taste loss will be voted on again next year. We believe March of 2022. That's what I thought. Okay, thank you. All right, no more questions for... Uh, but while we're talking about the program of work, can we go back to the letter of support to the first power? Or the grants in general? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so, basically we're going to apply for the elevator water tank at Mulberry Grove in the 315 regional area and have a matching funds from ARP of a quarter million dollars for that project. For that for the, you're talking about the water tank and the first? No, the water tank, the county's going to, the county's going to uh, apply for the state grant. You are the 31st? Two separate grants. We're going to apply for one grant or, ourselves right. for the elevator water tank, $2 million roughly, but the, the, the consultant's working on it. The two million gallon, two million dollar elevator storage tank in the Mulberry Grove area, with a two hundred fifty thousand dollar match from ARP. That's what we want to submit. And right. the first will submit that grant. Right, that's what I'm saying. So the, uh, well, that's my question: Is do you want a motion for that, as well as a motion for no. the letter of support? Yes. Do you want them in the same motion, or do you want two different motions? Two, two different ones. Okay. Okay. So there's the elevator tank. We're doing it correctly on behalf of Harris County Government. Well, I'll make the motion that we do the elevated tank using the uh, matching from the ARP money for the grant. Is that, is that what you mean? That's perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have a second? I'll second. Any discussion over that? All in favor? Thank All you. Right. Because these grants, you know, it was a 30-day window. We, we're moving fast. To, right. to put all stuff together. So, 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 so now you need a motion for the letter of support for diverse power and using two hundred fifty thousand dollars of the ARP money to go with that to show the state that we are very serious about trying to get broadband our citizens. Is that correct? That is correct. I made that motion. Second. Can we add the requirements that I was requesting for technology basing where they're specifically targeting? I know they're saying northeast and northwest. Um, yeah. I don't know if we can ask this. We're not the ones doing the grant. Mm -hmm. as we can request a copy of the grant application. As information on it. Yeah. That's when I was speaking with Mr. Sanders, 
bring the shepherd from the burst power here today. It is their um, area that's from I-85 all the way to Charlotte, is what he told me. That's what I understand too when I spoke with the uh, state I-85 all the way to Charlotte, so it's through Hamilton, Pine Mountain Valley, Pine Mountain, not around Pine Mountain. Pine Mountain Valley to Charlotte. Uh, from the White area, area that way. 109, that area there. Yeah. And um, now I don't know the technologies, you know. All their, all their customers base. But their customers base. Basically yeah. the top half of the county. Mm -hmm. From what I was doing, I spoke with them, and basically like White's fold that area all the way over to the shallow area through that. That's that's all I got. I didn't get all the technology stuff, but that's kind of what I was talking. But I, I will amend my motion to ask if they would give us some information items only based on exactly where the thing is going to go, especially if we're going to have to provide conduit in some of the area. And since it's a competitive grant, I don't know if they really want to disclose everything if they have right. anything going on. Right. 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 But, but what information they can give us? Right. Right. So I made that as a motion. Thank you. Everybody understands that. <laughs> it's going to kind of talk around a little bit. You got that, Miss Nancy? Yep. All right. Do I have a second? Oh, we did that. Do we have a second? I second it. All right. Any more discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Thank you. All right. Now I believe we're on to the uh, county attorney, Mr. Britt. Thank you, Vice Chairman, members of the board. Item number 11 for the board's consideration is an editor of all agreement the school district for the storage of county records as well as office space for the board of elections as the board is well aware uh, we entered into an agreement or an mou with the school district on the mercer med clinic project and as part of that the school district agreed to enter into an intergovernmental agreement with the county for one dollar per year for 50 years to lease the school property to the county for record storage, board of election offices, as well as space that we can use as a voting location. The county staff and other county officials have visited the school facilities and have deemed them to be sufficient for the above purposes. A proposed intergovernmental agreement was prepared, but I reviewed it, and the Board of Education approved it during their August 12th meeting. This agreement will allow most county records, including judicial records and election equipment, to be consolidated to one location for better management and allow the Board of Elections to have more office space and voting locations. With the consolidation of the county records, the old house located on State Route 116 behind the 911 Center will be emptied of the records and offered to the volunteer fire department for live fire exercises or torn down by public works. A motion if it is needed. If approved, the intergovernmental agreement will begin on September 1st and records will be moved into the facility soon thereafter. Well, I know we've been talking about that, so I'll, I'll make the motion that, that we approve this intergovernmental agreement with the Board of Education for the storage of county records in the Board of Elections office. Offices to be moved over to what was the old uh, Carver High School, Harris County Carverville School, and then Performing Learning Center. Uh, because I, we all know that we need some space for our board of elections when we have early voting. Amen. I heard an amen from someone. I'll second that. Uh, we have a second. Do we have any other discussion? Everyone in favor? All opposed? All right, it's approved. All right, thank you, Vice Chairman. The next item on the agenda is item number 12, which is a modification to a chief alone for the water meter project. As the board is well aware, a chief alone was obtained in connection with the water meter replacement project and had an original completion date of September 1st, 2020, which was extended in October of last year to go through December 1st, 2021. Due to various issues, Due to COVID-19 and limited staffing, the project is running behind schedule again, and a request therefore has been submitted to GIFA to extend the project, and GIFA is in agreement with the extension, and therefore a modification to the GIFA loan is required. Uh, this is a very vanilla standard uh, um, modification, and it's, it mirrors the last modification that we did. 
it just changes the date out. So a motion of vote is needed for the GFIL loan modification to extend the project completion date to May 1st, 2022. I make a motion that we extend the project to the date specified. And I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion? All those in favor? All opposed? All right, motion is approved. Uh, do we have any need for um, executive session? Russell, do you think we have any need? No, sir, not at this time. Anyone else? I just have to go for 10 session. I just have one. The um, ARP money and the list, the proposed list, I would like to ask if we could get together as soon as we can to at least discuss that. I'd like it hanging over my head and not knowing what we're going to do and how much we're going to use. Just, so I'm just, I'm just making a request that we can do that sooner rather than later. What about a work session before the next meeting? Like maybe 4.30 to 6.30 or 5 to 6.30. About 5 p.m. to 6.30 right before the next commission meeting. Right before the next meeting. Okay. In this room. Okay. 5 to 6.30. 5 o'clock to 6.30 immediately preceding the next commission meeting in this room. And that's September 4th. September 7th. I don't think I'll be here at that meeting, but um, I have all the faith confidence in all of you. <laughs> well, if you'd rather be here, I mean, I don't have a problem with well, it. What if we do it uh, September 14th meeting? That way I, I know I'll be here at that meeting. We'll have the 14th. I'm, but the, 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 second, the third, second meeting. September 21st. Second. Yeah, September 21st. Okay. I'm sorry. I was off a day. The last meeting in September, last 5 o'clock in this room. That sounds like a plan. And I'll send out materials beforehand. Right. Does anyone have anything else? Looks like Dr. Andrews wants to make a motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> Thank you all for being here.